Andrew Bolt is arguably Australia's best-known journalist. His newspaper columns appear regularly in News Limited papers in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Uh, he has heard weeknights on Sydney's 2GB radio and can be seen every Sunday on Channel 10's The Bolt Report. Uh, he also writes Australia's most read uh, political blog. Andrew, thank you so much for being part of our Think Again conference. Thank you for having me. Uh, if we were introducing you at the conference, you would have just received a standing ovation. <laughs> uh, because we really do honour you as someone who I think cares deeply about our country, uh, who thinks deeply about issues that are affecting our country, and who I think is quite courageous in uh, addressing things that perhaps others don't talk about. So I'm really interested in some of your views on things. And, uh, and looking forward to hearing some of what you say. I want to begin by quoting uh, the brilliant English journalist Malcolm Muggeridge uh, and get your thoughts on this. Uh, he wrote, Whereas other civilizations have been brought down by attacks of barbarians from without, ours has the unique distinction of training its own destroyers at its own educational institutions and then providing them with facilities for propagating their destructive ideology far and wide, all at the taxpayer's expense. Thus did Western man decide to abolish himself, creating his own boredom out of his own affluence, his own vulnerability out of his own strength, his own impotence out of his own erotomania, himself blowing the trumpet that brought the walls of his own city tumbling down, and having convinced himself that he was too numerous, laboured with pill and scalpel and syringe to make himself fewer, until at last, having educated himself into imbecility and polluted and drugged himself into stupefaction, he kneeled over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and became extinct. Uh, we seem to be falling apart and we seem to be dismantling ourselves. Would you agree with that? I've got some way to go, haven't I, in terms of writing? <laughs> That's not bad, is it? <laughs> um, it's uh, very pessimistic and I'm fairly pessimistic, perhaps not quite to that degree. Uh, there is also, um, you know, an element of a multicultural threat, an imported threat as well. I mean, where we have, uh, you know, volunteers of the CFA or the SES and uh, whatever rural fire service advise mm. not to wear their uniforms uh, going to and from work and uh, police uh, likewise in Victoria, uh, then, you know, that that's quite remarkable. But uh, given the various challenges that we do face, uh, it is true too that those in charge of our cultural institutions, the gatekeepers, the taxpayer, taxpayer funded uh, uh, you know, arbiters of morality and all that do seem to be on the side of um, dissolving what brings us together rather than finding the glue mm -hmm. and applying it. And I find that is really frightening. I mean, uh, you know, there, there has to be a will to bring us together. And instead, it seems to be a fashion um, which is uh, encouraged, nurtured, protected, strengthened by the cultural gatekeepers to find those things which disunite us and mm. celebrate those. Now, I'm not for dragooning everyone into one form of identity or one faith and heavens, you know, I'd be the first victim of that. But uh, I must say, you're playing with fire. Mm. You're just playing with fire. You mentioned it's become a bit fashionable to try to tear down uh, certain things within our nation. What do you think is driving that? Oh, well, look, part of it is the cult of mediocrity, of course. You know, um, for the mediocre, um, you know, tearing down things is a much easier way of um, asserting your, your individuality, your strength, your, your very existence than creating something, you know, for every... Leonardo da Vinci, there are 10,000 people that uh, find it quite empowering to put a scratch in his work or something like that. You know, I, go to the, I went to the Taj Mahal once and, and found uh, four guys carving their initials in letters a foot high. You know, I, I went ape uh, at, at seeing it, but you know, that's, that's the way it is, rattle a stick ac across the fence. Um, and that's also been, uh, in part, a cultural fashion. Don't, don't, you know, uh, to deconstruct, to, uh, to uh, deconstruct the classics, etc., uh, etc. Et it's something that the mediocre celebrate. And we went through a period where the very word elite was was 
uh, frowned on, despised. Yeah. And you have a look now too at our education system. How can you have universities which rely on putting through as many people as possible, and boy, do they get a lot of, lot of people now. And sometimes with enter scores, half, you know, 50% is just weird, mm. and not expect a diminution of quality, that it is all about output, not about quality. And when you can't even rely on institutions like universities to celebrate the best, instead to celebrate the many, then you're not going to get the thought leaders, you're going to get the the pack. One of the institutions that it seems quite fashionable to tear down is the church. Mm. Uh, Theodore Del Rimple, uh, an English writer, uh, wrote, to regret religion is in fact to regret our civilization and its monuments, its achievements and its legacy. The absence of religious faith, provided that faith is not murderously intolerant, can have a deleterious effect upon human character and personality. If you empty the world of purpose, make it one of brute fact alone, you empty it of reasons for gratitude. And a sense of gratitude is necessary for happiness and decency. For what can soon and all too easily replace gratitude is a sense of entitlement. Without gratitude, it's hard to appreciate or be satisfied with what you have. And so life will become an existential shopping spree that no product satisfies. Uh, do you think that our civilization is regretting religion? Um. I don't know that, the, well, I regret it, uh, to, to regret that uh, it's, it's dissolving, that's what I regret. I think, I think in the absence of faith, it's like, you know, G.K. Chesterton wrote, you know, you don't stop believing in God, you'll start believing in anything. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a reinvention of faiths, uh, in particular the green faith. And I thought it was so sad that some of the weaker churches, the churches that seem to lack the courage of their professed con con convictions were embracing the green faith as a way of renewing their own or attracting the young or some other meretricious kind of uh, reason. Mm. Um, not realising it was sort of pantheistic kind of, you know, worshipping something else. And um, so, so you're seeing that. And you're also seeing, because of the lack of genuine appreciation that this is a essentially a Christian culture where a lot of the freedoms are derived essentially from Christian teachings you know, the freedom of thought freedom of conscience uh, uh, the, the, the the individual above the machine all those kinds of things we forgot that and the lack of of, of, of appreciation for that and the role of the churches has let us left us peculiarly vulnerable to stronger faiths, not just the green faith, but now, of course, as you're seeing, the mm. lure of jihadism, where you're getting increasingly also converts to the faith. Mm. And, and these converts are given often, uh, you can look at Q&A, how many times I would have seen more Muslim converts or reverts, as they call themselves, on Q&A, picked because they speak for Islam, than I have seen Christians picked because they speak for Christianity on Q&A. And the difference in the way they're treated on Q&A is stark. Oh, when, when a Christian yeah. is on Q&A, they're pitted against a Dawkins or and yeah. they're, they're made an object of ridicule. Yes. When a Muslim is on the uh, panel, they are, to my view, protected. Well, and that's right. And, and they're carefully selected. I mean, you never see uh, Q&A picking a Muslim spokesman with a beard down to here. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a fiery kind of disposition. You get yes. ones that, you know, look, there's nothing to fear. We have nice Susan Carland here. We have nice Walid Ali here. Or we have nice someone else. And, and you're quite right. There's no confrontation of their faith or their teachings in a way that a Christian would be. You, you get a Catholic on there, you can be absolutely sure that questions one, two and three will be uh, about uh, uh, sexual abuse of children. So, so let me ask you this. Last month, um, here in Melbourne, there were, I think, three arson attacks on Catholic churches within four. three... Four arson attacks within three or four days. Now, in Queensland, I didn't know about that except that I read your blog mm. and, and linked to it. I think most people would have been unaware. You made the point, if there were four mosques that had been set on fire, the whole country would know about that. Uh, 
why the difference in the way the media treats the Christian church and the Islamic faith? Well, one is taking it for granted, and two is it symbolises, particularly for the left, a, a sort of um, you know revolt, revolt against the father, you, you're against authority, you're against the church. You don't want someone to tell you don't do that, don't do that, and you know don't eat lollies before uh, bedtime and that kind of stuff. You know, mm. it's fun killing. Um, so there's that, and like I say, taking for granted, not knowing, you know, it's kicking at the props, it's just weird. Islam, there is also a genuine and admirable wish not to demonise the other, and that is, that is good, and that is also in Christian teaching, um, and uh, a fear of, of making vulnerable people more vulnerable to racist attacks, and all that's laudable, that is laudable. Um, but I also wonder, you know, whether there isn't actually in this excessive uh, uh, courtesy towards Islam and don't talk about the faith, don't talk about terrorism, don't talk about the Quranic uh, passages about jihad, you know, let's, uh, Islam means peace, you know, which is not true. And um, I wonder whether there's actually a fear. And mm. I don't just mean a fear of being attacked if you say something bad, although. I know of five journalists that have been subjected to uh, very serious, known to police, um, uh, threats against their lives, forcing two to move home. Uh, that might limit a little bit of discussion. I know cartoonists who wouldn't portray uh, uh, images of uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad in a way that they would Christ for sheer fear. Now you're talking about journalists here in Australia. In Australia, five journalists here in Australia. Um, there's not just that fear. I wonder whether there's also a fear of a tinderbox going up. That, uh, and I don't just mean that if something is said about Islam that uh, Muslims will get picked on, and which none of us would, would, would wish to see, mm. but whether there is just the fear of our social compact tearing apart, yeah. right? And I wonder whether that is why these rules about, these laws about free speech and what you can, can and can't say and all that, it's like a lot of people who have created a very combustible mix in Australia through foolish, uh, foolishly optimistic uh, mass migration programs and humanitarian programs, intakes from certain parts of the world, think, oh, they'll fit in, they'll fit in. Uh, all that kind of stuff and multicultural programs which reward the least assimilated above the more, most, uh, whether they don't think that that has created a little open petrol tank with one careless match and woof, and right. whether that is in part driving this amazing exercise into don't say jihadism is caused by Islam, don't say this about Islam, don't portray that otherwise, and yeah. then they'll be confronted with uh, perhaps some terrible social errors we've made. I want to talk a bit more about Islam in a moment, but I think you've described yourself, and I don't want to pigeonhole you, but I think you've described yourself as an agnostic. Would that be fair? And yet you strike me as one of the great public defenders of the Christian faith. Um, would that be fair? And, and if you would accept that, that you do publicly defend the Christian faith, as a person who doesn't himself subscribe to the Christian faith, why do you defend it so much? Well, one, I see the link between uh, the faith and the freedoms I like. And uh, I think there's no, it's not coincidence that the freest societies in the world are almost universally Christian. Mm. That's, that's not coincidence. Um, I see also Christianity as uh, having inspired many fights, many resistances to various totalitarian streams of thought, communism and whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the dignity of the individual is above all a Christian teaching and I think that is fantastic. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I find I'm protecting myself if I protect Christianity in broad. That's right. not a, you know, there are expressions of Christianity that both you and I would but, but in, in, the, in the main. So that's one reason. The other reason is, I do wonder whether Christianity has enough defenders even in those paid to defend it. I mean, I look at some churches, you know, the Anglican Church, the Uniting Church, the Presbyterian Church, and 
I never hear them uh, defending their faith as a faith, or sorry, really, almost never. Mm. I thought it was really interesting this Easter, uh, the Easter messages from the various churches were more explicitly religious than I recall for many, many times, you know, for a long time. And I wonder whether that's in part because the, the challenge from Islam has, has sharpened a sort of uh, thought as to what is their own faith. Yes. But up to now, up to now, it's been more, if you're an Anglican uh, bishop or a, a Uniting Church, Presbyterian moderator or something like that, it seems to me that the way they express their faith is in purely political terms. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they could just as well run for the Greens and it's almost indistinguishable, you know, where be nice to refugees and uh, beware of uh, global warming and, yeah. What about Christ? What about God? See, now this makes me curious because, uh, as I understand it, you're a person who you admire Jesus, respect his teachings, don't believe that he rose from the dead and is God, but you believe he's a great influence on humanity. And so you're concerned that the church continues to preach this Jesus, even though, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you wouldn't say you fully believe in the Jesus that the church teaches, but you believe they should keep teaching that Jesus because he is a stabilizing and a, a influence for peace. Have I, got I don't you want right? to sound like uh, you know <coughs> a fallen arch archangel or anything <laughs> like that, but you know, I put it like if the Pope woke up tomorrow mm. and said, "Thought, my good, you know, my goodness, I, I don't believe in God anymore," I would hope and pray pray that he not tell anyone and that he continue to do the business because I just do think that is important and you know it, true I, I simply can't you know, if you think that faith is a gift right you mm. can't will yourself to faith you can't you open yourself maybe to it and then bang but uh, I can't honestly believe that if there is a God, it's the God as described, and, and I, you know all that kind. Of, whatever, I don't want to persuade anyone. Mm. But um, but that said, you know, if I if I actually think of the example and the teaching and the amazing courage it took when you when when Christ, uh, the one described in the Bible, goes to Jerusalem, knowing knowing he will be killed, mm. knowing that, and knowing that, and, and not too killed by the way, he will be killed, and, and knowing that he must do so if his message is to survive, I think that's just, that's just, how can you not be inspired? I mean, just talking about it, the hair's standing on my head. Um, and you know, when you go to a place like, um, um, you know, places in various places in Israel, where he preaches Sermon on the Mount, there's mm. a, a wonderful church, very simple, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, with uh, the excerpts of the Sermon on the Mount uh, around the, the, the church walls. And um, I find that lifts you in another place, you know. Now, is that um, a spiritual thing? Uh, but it makes you connected, connected yeah. to the past, connected to other people, thinking of your place in the world, and most importantly, giving you some humility. I think that is the teaching that is missing so much from this society, humility. I, I forget who coined the phrase, but I was reading some time ago of what someone called the cut flower syndrome, where I love the smell of this flower, it's wonderful. I just don't like the garden in which it's growing. So I pick the flower out of the garden, expecting I will always be able to smell the aroma. But of course, for a while you can, but after some time, you can't, because it's been disconnected. Is that what you're saying about how you see the role of the church in Australia and the continued enjoyment of freedoms we perhaps take for granted? Oh, in look, I do. And when you say that, I mean, you're pricking my conscience because what you're really describing is me. And uh, I'm absolutely aware of that and I feel guilty. Um, I mean, um, Cardinal Pell, you know, once uh, reprimanded me uh, in a friendly way, you know, 
he, he said, uh, you, you, are, you are living on the fat of Christianity and, uh, and I'm not renewing it. And I'm quite aware of that. I'm um, absolutely. So I feel quite guilty about that. But I, I assuage that guilt by thinking, look, the way the media is, if I were a Christian, a professed Christian, mm. if I were a priest, would I be free to write about Christianity without being written off? And I think maybe I'm doing the Lord's work under a cloak, under a cover. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do, I don't think I'd be half as effective if I were not an agnostic. Well, that's really weird for me now because I'm a pastor and you're making me almost glad that you're not a Christian so I can continue to enjoy your writing. <laughs> but it, but it, isn't it true? If I, if, I, if I said, you know, if I defended uh, the work of Catholic priests, for example, as a Catholic, people would say, he would say that, wouldn't he? Right. If I discussed abortion and for me the sin, there's a loaded word, the sin of late-term abortions. Mm. Leave aside you know, the argument about just late-term abortions. Healthy, healthy babies. I mean, healthy babies that if another de decision were made, they would be born in a few weeks. In fact, if they were born now, they'd survive. But we allow them to be killed. Now, I think that's terrible. If I wrote that from a religious perspective, they'd say, well, you're just religious. Of yes. course. Of course, someone who is uh, pro-choice is never described as an atheist when uh, discussing their pro-choice views. It's only if you are uh, a conservative That's right. It's that the, it's we the mention label. the fact that you're also a Christian. Because by labelling you, then they have in brackets, he would say that, wouldn't he? Mm. I want to talk about Islamic terrorism for a moment. Last year, the former head of the Australian Army, Peter Lay, uh, predicted the war with radical Islam could last 100 years. More recently, the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, described radical Islam as a greater threat to world peace mm. than communism was during the height of the Cold War. Do you think they're overstating the threat? Um, no, yes. Um, no, 100 years. Um, what, it's been going for 1,300 already? I mean, what do you think? <laughs> what, it's suddenly going to finish? Oh, that's okay. That's, that's actually an optimistic uh, prediction. Look, it's a rival faith. Um, you read... But Andrew, aren't all religions basically the same anyway? They're all the same paths to God, so they're not really rivals, are they? As the twig is bent, as you know, that's provocative. I know that's, you're just uh, devil's advocate, which is... I think a disgusting thing to do for if you're a pastor. <laughs> the special rules when talking to you. Oh, is that is that yeah. is that right? Okay. Um, no, look, uh, the, look. As the twig is bent, right? As the Jesuits often say. Yeah, um, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. So grows the tree. The twig, in the case of Christianity, um, leave aside the Old Testament, it takes its name from Christ is a man the Bible cannot recall lifting a hand against anyone mm. by one loss of temper in the temple. And he took it out on a, on a bench, you know, a table. <laughs> you know, whoopee-doo. Okay, but didn't, it's ne never struck anyone mm. and, and prevented people from striking others. You know, let, he was without sin, cast the first stone. Uh, very slow to judge, very slow to punish. True, of course, Christianity does have a hell and that's the ultimate punishment. So, But on earth, that is the model behaviour for a Christian. His example. Well, I think hell is safe if it's in the afterlife because then God can enforce it. You don't want it here and now because then it's up to you and I to it. That's dangerous. Exactly. Let's leave the hell part aside. Um, but Islam, of course, as a founder, that uh, was very different, very different. Mm. And he did kill people and he did execute people and he did uh, you know, exterminate a Jewish tribe and he did uh, slay people who mocked him and he did have uh, you know, women put to death for saying nasty things about him. And um, as that twig is bent, so grows the faith. I mean, there is no... For all the talk about Islam as peace and for all the truth true uh, 
assertions that uh, most Muslims uh, would never strike you, you yeah. know, from not being Muslim yourself. Totally understand that. But it's an utter fantasy to think that the substantial minority in the world that do believe that you should be punished, smitten, killed, executed, jailed, whatever, for denying or for insulting uh, Allah or Muhammad, um, that they, it'd be foolish to think they don't dry, you know, gain their perspective from the example of the founder of their faith and the words in some of the texts. Julie Bishop said that um, to truly defeat Islamic State is to challenge and repudiate its ideology. So you're talking about what drives the ideology of Islamic terrorism. Do you think it's even possible to challenge that ideology given political correctness, given the incredible lack of, um, to me it seems, ability for people to even think clearly about religion anymore? Well, first, to challenge the ideology. Now, you carefully use the phrase ideology, and Bishop does too. That we all know. It's not, it's not Islam here and ideology there. Hmm. It's an artificial distinction we make to try and spare people's blushes and not be seen to be too mean and not fall foul of various laws against, uh, against expressing our opinion. Sorry, can I clarify what you mean? Do you mean... Instead of talking about this ideology, You're talking about let's talk about the Quran. Yeah, and the Quran and the Hadith, and, and exactly. And um, so, when you say that the future, or well, Julie Bishop says, when the future is in reform, you first have to say reform what. Yes. And if you can't even say the right what, you're a long way from reforming anything. That's the problem, and. It's all very well for us to say reform this and reform that. But in the end, who can reform the faith? Not the people that don't follow it. Right. It has to come from within the faith. That's what uh, President Sisi of Egypt said, said in his speech on uh, January 1st. Uh, a speech to religious uh, leaders in Egypt saying it's got to be reformed. Now, whether it can or can't, I don't know. But I think we'll be a bit safer if someone at least tries. I heard you on 2GB radio with Steve Price um, being critical of the church in its response, or I think you referred to the, the lack of response by the church to the rise of Islamic extremism. Mm. Can you expand a little bit more on your thoughts regarding that? Um, what do you think the church should be saying right now? Well, I don't necessarily think that the church should be going out there like the church militant, you know, smite the infidel and resist and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know how productive that would be anyway, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not the message of Christ. That said, I do think the church should be very explicit about its teachings and the sort of society that relies on those teachings, what follows from that. Um, it should not take for granted the freedoms that we have and, uh, you know, pretend or not assert uh, that they are largely derived from the Judaic, Christian, Hellenic tradition and with, uh, with a lot of that, the Christian part of it. I think that needs to be taught and asserted. And I don't think they should be preaching falsehoods. Do not bear false witness. Islam does not mean peace. The meaning of Islam is not peace. It's a submission. Now, you may think, yeah, we also preach submit to God, but you know, let's not mm. let's not put sugar on this. We're about honesty. And I really think uh, a little integrity in there uh, would not go astray. Now, like I say, you know, don't bear the cudgel, mm. but do it more in here's an alternative. These preachings lead to the kind of society that welcomes you, that is, that is, makes it safe for you to move, to speak, to profess different things. Do you think that the rise of Islamic extremism therefore presents the church with an opportunity to present the Christian faith as a contradistinction 
to Islamic extremism? I think that's without a doubt. I mean, you know, it's, it, I was reading, uh, who was it? Was it Huntington or something? Someone like that saying, you know, talking about a salience of belief, of, of, of a tradition, of a, a loyalty. And so when uh, the September 11 attacks happened in America, boom, American flags everywhere. Once something that you have taken for granted is challenged or mm -hmm. even taken away, you value it much more. I mean, you go on the uh, online for an auction and you bid, you know, you think uh, you're asked to, to nominate uh, a, a figure that you'd bid up to for a, a, a painting or, or a sofa or anything. Oh, that's worth $200. That's my maximum bid. And then you see someone say, ding, I'll bid 220. You suddenly think, that's a good sofa, I'll bid 240. You know, it's when someone else wants it or is challenging you that you revalue something. Oh, that's a trivial thing, but that applies here to Christianity too. And I think the more that the challenge from Islam comes, and we saw the same with Nazism, we saw the same with communism, a lot of people invested more in their faith. It became more important to them. And I think that will happen here too. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating a religious war or conflict or anything like that. But when your beliefs are challenged, and you, some people will think, ah, oh, they weren't worth it, I'll submit. A lot of others will say, it was worth it, and I will hold true. I will re Where did the revival of Catholicism in Europe come from uh, post-war? The very countries where it was most under-challenged, where mm. people, authorities were trying to drive it underground. Poland is, is a yeah. perfect example. Whereas in Italy, the home of the Vatican, I mean, it's got one of the lowest birth rates in Europe. What happened to the preaching on, on you know, against right. contraception? So the challenge presents a great opportunity. From the challenge, people re, you know, look again. And I, I think that's true. You know, and, which and has actually always be been careful. the history of the church. Hmm? Which has always been the history of the church, actually. Well, you look at the origins of the church. You know, it flourished in, in very oppressive times. That's where it came from. Hmm. And it's interesting, you look at sociologists like, uh, I think Rodney Stark might have said it too, um, it is those churches which put the highest price on their admission, you know, to be a member of our church, you must, uh, that seem to have the most committed followings. Maybe not necessarily the most, mm. but at least the most that actually turn up. And it's, take Mormons. You couldn't have a faith more mocked within the broad, well, I hesitate to call it Christian, would I get in, no, it's not Christian at all, but Mormon, uh, you know, it's a Book of Mormon show. Mm. I mean, it's a show dedicated to laughing at Mormons. Everyone laughs at Mormons. And look at the ridiculous lengths they make their uh, novices go through. That You've got to go to some foreign country yes. and knock on endless doors and be laughed at and ridiculed, you know, knock, knock, knock. Uh, who wants to do that? And yet, faith is growing. Can you believe it? Mm. Whereas churches that ask nothing of you, not even to turn up every Sunday, mm. nothing, and in some cases not even to believe in the divinity of Christ, yeah. what's happening to their membership? Mm. There's a, a great quote from Mark Stein, who I know you are fond of, where he writes, in this world, if Jesus came back today, He'd most likely be a gay Anglican bishop in a committed relationship, driving around in an environmentally friendly car with an arms of a hugging sticker on the way to an interfaith dialogue with a Wiccan and a couple of Wahhabi imams. Wimp Jesus, he writes, is a loser. The churches who go down that path are emptying out and dying. Christ wouldn't be that, because there would be no Christ had he done that. No. Now, you know, so you're saying there'll be, no, there'll be no church. And there'll be no church. Um, look, it is true that uh, Christ um, did preach, you know, don't, uh, in a sense, you don't need to follow the, the forms of the faith, some of the forms of the faith. That is true. And so you might say he's a guy that didn't care about, you know, just was making it up as he went along, which is probably what a lot of Jews at the time thought. But... On the other hand, he was a fundamentalist in one sense, in the good sense. Mm. Going back to the deepest teachings, you know, 
against the Ten Commandments, he had two. The deepest teachings. And it was how you lived your life uh, towards other people rather than the empty forms that counted for him. And uh, that's a terribly inspiring message. He would not have done as you, you know, this and that. It would have been a profound living of the essential faith. That's what it would have been. I love this because here I've got Andrew Bolt, agnostic, almost saying to pastors, please <laughs> hold the line, stay true to Jesus. Save me, save my society by staying true to Jesus. I don't, but anyway, you should. I Look, like I'm your... sorry about that. I feel, like I say, I feel terrible about saying that. I actually admire your honesty. Ah, oh, well, you might uh, you might better reprove me for uh, not following the uh, convictions to the ultimate end. Let me change tack completely for a moment, so I don't want you to feel too uncomfortable. <laughs> Let's talk about something just non-controversial, like homosexual marriage. Mm. Look, while I need to see more evidence about the success of gay parenting, I have to say, uh, my sister is, uh, is a gay parent too. Um, and other people I know as well. And once a child is born, a child is born. And uh, if they can get love, they're already ahead of a lot of other children in this world, let me tell you, yes. from all sorts of families. And that is the most important to me. But I would say this, I come at it from a slightly different angle. I agree that marriage is fundamentally about children, right? If it wasn't about children, it doesn't matter, it barely matters at all to me. Right. Who you pair up with and have for how long and whether you're happy in that, whether you're not, that's, that's your business. You're two adults or three adults and you can, so what? Yep. But how you socialise your children, that is extremely important to me. And to, to all of us, we do not want underparented children uh, roaming the street at 2 a.m. We know mm. what that leads to. We do not want children who are feeling let down, bruised, betrayed in the most fundamental way and with no loyalty to their society because they've been, they don't even have loyalty to a family unit. That's in everyone's interest. Now. This is where we'd part ways. You would actually see in some ways a marriage of a man and a woman is in itself as a reflect, you know, it's, it's blessed by God and uh, all this. Kind of, for me, it's all about the children. The institution of marriage was invented to glue men to women for the term of the natural life, hopefully of at least their children, as long as those two should live. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. And if you start loosening that glue, that tradition, that taboo, then you're going to get more people not feeling obliged to their partner, not feeling obliged to their children, not feel, and you've seen that already. You seem to be arguing that gay marriage will somehow uh, affect the tradition of heterosexual marriage. I do, I do. How do you see that happening? Well, I think Marriage, like so many traditions, is one that it's a, it's a, traditions are sanctified by observance and by time. Mm -hmm. And if you start reinventing traditions, you take away some of the awe of them, you make them man-made and ones that can be changed at will. It becomes a supermarket. It doesn't become something that's been handed down. It doesn't become an inheritance. You spend it. Mm -hmm. And once that tradition weakens, Hey, you know, we can, we can, marriage is no longer forever. No one believes that now anymore. Mm. Um, marriage is not forever. Uh, marriage now can be with uh, various people you wouldn't have dreamed of before. Uh, for example, two gays, two lesbians, and that's, you know, like I say, I've got family and friends, and um, that's terrific. That's wonderful that they're together, and I, that's not the issue. But it becomes a question of choice, not of something, a tradition, something sanctified by something bigger than you, something compelling you to be together. And when that happens, yes, yes. And we're really seeing, I mean, marriage has been made a creation of people, which is, I agree essentially is, uh, to be cast aside almost at whim. 
and true enough. Uh, some people still stick together for a long time and others don't. A lot of people don't and children are the victims. You wrote in a column in 2011, uh, let me quote your column, the whole idea of changing the Marriage Act is to force us collectively to bless same-sex unions despite the reluctance of many to do so. But is it right or useful to get respect from those who still don't approve of same-sex unions just by changing the law to make them call these unions marriages? And where does such forcing stop once you start? In fact, I'm sure same-sex marriage will quickly be followed by cases in discrimination tribunals to make people accept them. No, is, is there a deeper agenda here with the homosexual marriage issue than simply let's allow two people to be happy and have a ceremony and, and exchange rings? Is there well, a deeper I, I agenda? Think, I think there is. Um, I think there is. Not, not with everyone, obviously, but uh, that would be wrong. But I do think the issue does appeal to people with little tolerance. I mean, it's in the name of tolerance, but pushed by people with limited tolerance themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just saw... Tanya Plibersek, who was acting Labour leader, said, no, oh, I don't want to make this a conscience vote after all for Labour MPs. I want to make, I want to force them to back same-sex marriage, even though many are Christians who wouldn't have a bar, you know. Mm. And I think that compulsion, and you've seen in America too, you know, with shops that refuse to make, even a bakery refused to make a, a cake for a same-sex mm. marriage. Well, I think maybe they should have, but that was their choice. Uh, hounded out of business, threatened with the law, president buying in, people, mayors, it's ridiculous. Mm. That compulsion is, is, is not good. And I do think, if you think of it like this, you know, there are enough laws at the moment, it seems to me, where gays can form a lifelong union and have a ceremony and it's blessed by the state and all the contracts of you know, who gets what if there's a breakup, and the children and the law guarantees you know, children of certain rights in that relation. It's all there. Mm. It is all there. It's not called marriage, but you can call it something else. You can do what you like. You can you can have your family. But what it is is they're saying, oh, we want the state to call it marriage, not something else. So it's. A, it's being used as a way to infer, to infer a, a respect, which most people would feel, but some don't, uh, and an authority and an authenticity. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what it is. It's a quest for recognition. It's not a quest for marriage necessarily, because all the forms of marriage are the right there. It yeah. doesn't have the name. And, and it seems to me difficult to demand respect or to demand recognition. I just think, I prefer a more organic approach. Mm. If this is, uh, and as many say, and as my relatives and friends assert, something that is uh, sustainable, buzzword, uh, something that is healthy, something that affirms life, doesn't challenge it, uh, it will in time have its own momentum, own traditions, own authority. We often hear it said that, um, you know, uh, gay marriage is inevitable. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're opposed it, you're on the wrong side of history. Uh, do you agree with those sorts of statements? It's almost argument oh, it's by... It's lazy. It's lazy. I mean, you know, with that kind of the historical inevitability of what, what wouldn't we be subscribing to? Euthanasia was historically inevitable, you know? Right. Let's uh, you give in now, you know? Eugenics was once historically inevitable. Uh, the domination of uh, black nations by whites, that was historically inevitable. And you know, where do you stop? I hate that. That's ridiculous. Who's, who is so far-sighted to see where we will be a thousand years from now, plot a straight line and say, well, let's get to the end now. Let's cut out all the bits about you know, democracy and other people's right to this, and discussion. You know, it's ridiculous. It seems incredibly arrogant. Doesn't oh, it's it? extremely arrogant. That's one thing Christianity does teach us. Mentioned it before, humility. Mm. You know, there is someone bigger. For, for, you know, Christians say there's someone bigger that's God. and fine, That's great. But for me, you know, symbolically, it, it's talking about the weight of thousands of years of lived human experience and wisdom. Be careful. You do not know. We have, mankind has made some historically, mm. historical 
terrible decisions, barbaric decisions that we came to regret. And who knows whether what's today's passion might not turn out to be tomorrow's disaster. You mentioned a family member who is in a gay relationship. How have you managed uh, your opposition to same-sex marriage whilst at the same time a deep personal relationship with someone that you obviously love and care about? Or have you been unable to keep those two things apart? In one case, that has proved sadly very difficult and I very much regret that, very much. Um, in another, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, but then we don't discuss it, but you know, it's loving as always. And uh, for that, I'm really grateful. But um, that's the way it is. I mean, you can't... A lot of people are in the position that I'm in, but you can't have I think follow your reason to a conclusion and then because of pain or wanting to be liked or all that sort of stuff, as a public commentator I think sacrifice what you know or feel is the truth and say something different. Mm. I'm paid to express my opinion, I want to maintain a loyalty to my to, to people that uh, want to, that pay good money uh, and attention uh, to give what I think is an honest answer. And it's, maybe I've chosen wrong, but that's the way it is. One of the interesting discussions in the church at present is, uh, we, you know, we've always said, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, it a lot seems of people like don't make that distinction. And they you, don't. Yeah, but it seems difficult. today it's almost like it, unless you love the sin, you hate the sinner. It's a difference of opinion. I mean, I have gay friends who agree with me on this issue. Right. And I, uh, I you know, I've, and I would argue that, uh, particularly for gay men, that the issue of socialised children, well socialised children, is very important for them. I mean, gays are some of the first to get picked on. Mm. Uh, you know, by uh, by young men uh, wanting to under socialise men uh, with uh, fists. So help me as a pastor. I want to. I, I think the church should have input into this debate. The mm. church shouldn't be silent. But at the same time, I don't want to ostracise a lot of good people whom Jesus loves every bit as much as me. Uh, but now they would never come to my church because I oppose same-sex marriage, therefore I'm a hater and a bigot. Or is that just life now and there's no way to avoid that trap? Look, you're, you're with a faith that judges you know, between the quick and the dead. You're in a church which divides sinners and, and, and non-sinners, you know, believers, that's got a heaven and a hell. You think if everyone was to agree with you on every point, there would be no need for a hell. There would be no hell. There'd be no one to fill it. So you have to get over this modern thing of you can't offend anyone. Inevitably, you will. And the clearer you speak, the more you will offend. All you can do is proclaim a truth and hope enough hear it and be glad of those who do. And those who don't, I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to smite the unrighteous or offend, uh, no, but uh, you cannot tailor your message uh, to suit those who will never agree to the message that you're actually meant to proclaim. Let me finish with a couple of questions about the church and how you see it. So let me ask that question. How do you perceive the church in Australia? Broadly. Depends which one you're talking well, about. Let's talk about our churches. Thing. Let's talk about Pentecostals, or as I heard you once call us, happy clappers. How do you perceive our churches? Um, Pentecostals, I see, is a growing church, mm. uh, one that's engaging with people, that has got a contemporary um, setting for an old faith without betraying, without betraying it. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's... And it's authentic. It's not like... Um, uh, you know, the Anglican priest in a cassock and sandals strumming a guitar in a magnificent church with stained glass windows and a perfectly good organ that I'd rather hear anyway. 
I mean, that kind of pandering is, is appalling. It's, uh, you, you, I, I, I tend to believe yours is more authentic. Now, I, there's plenty of churches in your fold where you probably couldn't say that. And it isn't heavily reliant on the caliber of the pastor. Yes. You know, and uh, who's to know that all your pastors are up to snuff? Um, Catholics, I mean... Um, so can I, can I stay with our churches mm. for a moment? Because that's probably more relevant for us. What don't you like about our kind of churches? Well, there's nothing for me. So what? I'm not, I'm not a, you know, you do what you do. Mm. And as far as I can, you know, the only church that I've got any real intimacy with in the Pentecostal line, uh, as it acquired services, mm. uh, would be um, Hillsong, obviously, from watching it on TV. And a couple that I visited in uh, Uganda. Um, so that's all I've got, and I think it's uh, highly entertaining um, <laughs> and engaging. Yeah. Uh, music wise and taste wise, I'm a traditionalist, so mm -hmm. what do you expect me to like? I'd rather hear Mozart. <laughs> if you were to be critical of our churches, um, what would you say? I think that's a problem for you, or I think that's something that, that you guys need to do something about. Well, I, I, I don't really have any criticism, mainly because I don't have a deep knowledge of it and mm -hmm. I'd hesitate to criticise. But in terms of fighting the battles that I'm talking about, um, I think, and this is, not, this is a strength of yours, it's not something you can invent suddenly. You don't obviously have the structures of the tradition and the history that enable you to speak or the reach at the moment, although that's obviously quickly changing, to speak with authority to the rest of the public. Because if you, from my point of view, it's, the, it's what Christianity can do for my society, mm -hmm. generally, that I'm keen on. And if you talk to your own without getting involved in the wider debates that's obviously of less use to me in a purely pragmatic way. Yeah. Although no doubt you've got flocks that I'm quite happy and being well socialised. Um, so I'd have more criticism of the established churches which do have an inherited power to do something for not using that power. For a movement like ours that doesn't have that inherited power, but we want to be in the public square mm. and we want to be taken seriously, we also want to be wise about the way we do it. Oh, yes. Talk to that. Well, What advice would you give us? I, I always think when you're arguing, I've always thought a lot of Christian teachings, and not all, obviously from my point of view, but a lot of te Christian teachings sum up and uh, inherited a long-lived wisdom. Now, ne necessarily over time, people's experiences change, and that should change too. But... Generally, generally speaking, and on many of the great social issues, I'm, I'm pretty sympathetic to the broad Christian approach to it. But when you're arguing against euthanasia, against the abortion, against same-sex marriage or whatever issue you care to take, I think to reach out beyond your followers in this society, in this society is important to not reference as your ultimate authority, God or the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be creative. I don't say ditch them. I don't say, and therefore don't mention, don't mention the God. But I do say, if it is a wisdom that's in that Bible, that it knows where, you know, how humanity, the crooked timber and what will happen if, that that's really what it is, have the wit to discover what it is about the thing that you're fighting for or against, how that will work out in practice. Mm -hmm. Let God's word, in a sense, his, his message on a particular social issue, guide you into finding the deeper truths of that social issue. So, you know, with euthanasia, it's not just, well, taking life is a sin. Mm -hmm. It's also whether a society like that that trashes the individual worth of the most humble member of that society, who's safe? Mm. What next? You know, are you really 
what, 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 what is this power that you're exerting over another human being? Who are you to say that some lives are not worth living? The lonely, what have they to fear from a society mm. that deems some lives too miserable to continue? Mm. Who then actually has the power, the sufferer or the person with the injection or the relatives thinking, gosh, I don't really want to be at this hospice, you know, I've got other things to do and how much money might I get, you know, things like that. I think you need to engage with the people. For a, for a Christian person to say, well, I disagree because the Bible says it's wrong. No good. Lazy. Intellectually lazy. Lazy. Yeah. And lacks any authority or ability to come no. through. No. And what have you to say to someone who doesn't follow the faith? Mm. You know, th th there must be a reason for Christ or God to deem that this is so and this must not be so, yes. let you discover what that is. Mm. Don't just argue from authority. Let me finish with one last question. In 1932, a man named Winston Churchill was very nearly hit by a car as he crossed Fifth Avenue in New York City. Uh, had that taxi hit him, the second half of the 20th century would have looked very different. Here's my question. Do you think that a person can still make a difference in our culture? Or is it too hard for one person to change anything? Oh no, people can make a difference, but um, it's not, but even Winston Churchill, right? Say he'd been hit by that car. Uh, are we presuming then that Hitler would have beaten Britain? Or did, you know, cometh the hour, cometh the man, did Winston Churchill sum up an essential resistance in British culture to this authoritarianism that uh, Nazism uh, represented, would there not have been someone else as well? Maybe the war would have dragged on another year. Maybe someone more brilliant would have come. But do you really think Britain would have folded its tent? I don't think so. I don't think so. So individuals can make, make a difference, but it comes to this, whether the, whether the difference they make is, is, whether their example, their words, whatever, sum up a feeling within many people, it's the power that others invest in you that makes you strong, not necessarily your power over them, unless you're in an authoritarian regime, of course. Mm. So it's really, I mean, this is what Tolstoy grappled with in War and Peace, obviously, you know, in saying that uh, Napoleon was an absolute a word I can't use in front of Christian pastors, but he was terrible. And Napoleon, what was he? He was nothing. There was a tide of history that had just... Ju ju and he was giving himself airs. He was really a cork on the waves, you know, drifting on the tides of history and giving himself airs. Mm. That might be a bit over the top, but, uh, you know, it's an individual genius to Napoleon, but in the end, even the genius of Napoleon could not f stop his ultimate demise. The forces of history or collective humanity were greater than this one individual. So what then is the role for the individual? The individual is to proclaim a truth and to hope that that truth is heard by enough people that their, the power in, in their witness inspires or, or gathers by, you know, like moths to a flame, the power of many others who feel the same and feel alone, but know that they're not. And in, and in suddenly rediscovering a community, a brotherhood or a sisterhood, that that power is magnified and the truth speaks much louder. Andrew Bolt, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's a pleasure. We really appreciate it. No worries.